Good day. Today we are discussing anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a serious allergic reaction with a rapid onset. It may cause death and requires emergent diagnosis and treatment. Consensus clinical criteria have been developed to provide consistency for diagnosis. The terms anaphylactic and anaphylactoid were previously applied to immunoglobulin E-dependent and IgE-independent events, respectively. Because the final pathway in both events is identical, anaphylaxis is the term now used to refer to both. Hypersensitivity is an inappropriate immune response to generally harmless antigens, manifesting a continuum from minor to severe manifestations. Anaphylaxis represents the most dramatic and severe form of immediate hypersensitivity. Food, medication, insect stings, and allergen immunotherapy injections are the most common provoking factors for anaphylaxis, but any agent capable of producing a sudden degranulation of mast cells or basophils can induce anaphylaxis. Latex hypersensitivity is increasing in prevalence in the general population with a resultant risk for anaphylaxis. The clinical criteria for anaphylaxis are urticaria, generalized itching or flushing, or edema of lips, tongue, uvula, or skin developing over minutes to hours and associated with at least one of the following. Respiratory distress or hypoxia, hypotension or cardiovascular collapse, or associated symptoms of organ dysfunction such as hypotonia, syncope, and incontinence. Two or more signs or symptoms that occur minutes to hours after allergen exposure. Skin and or mucosal involvement, respiratory compromise, hypotension or associated symptoms, and persistent gastrointestinal cramps or vomiting. We also consider anaphylaxis when patients are exposed to a known allergen and develop hypotension. Anaphylaxis, for the most part, arises from the activation of mast cells and basophils through a mechanism involving cross-linking of IgE and aggregation of the high affinity receptors for IgE. Upon activation, mast cells and or basophils quickly release preformed mediators from secretory granules that include histamine, tryptase, carboxypeptidase A, and proteoglycans. Downstream activation of phospholipase A2 followed by cyclooxygenases and lipooxygenases produces arachidonic acid metabolites, including prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and platelet-activating factor. The inflammatory cytokine tumor necrosis factor alpha is released as a preformed mediator and also as a late-phase mediator with other cytokines and chemokines. These mediators are responsible for the pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. Histamine stimulates vasodilation and increases vascular permeability, heart rate, cardiac contraction, and glandular secretion. Prostaglandin D2 is a bronchoconstrictor, pulmonary and coronary vasoconstrictor, and peripheral vasodilator. Leukotrienes produce bronchoconstriction, increase vascular permeability, and promote airway remodeling. Platelet activating factor is also a protein bronchoconstrictor and increases vascular permeability. Tumor necrosis factor alpha activates neutrophils, recruits other effector cells, and enhances chemokine synthesis. These overlapping and synergistic physiologic effects contribute to the overall pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. Common causes for anaphylaxis, anaphylactoid, and allergic reactions include drugs like beta-lactam antibiotics, acetyl salicylic acid, trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole, vancomycin, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and virtually any drug. Others include hymenoptera stings, insect parts, molds, radiographic contrast material, vaccines, latex, and blood products. Foods and additives may also cause anaphylaxis, such as shellfish, soybeans, nuts, specifically peanuts and tree nuts, wheat, milk, eggs, salicylates, seeds, and sulfites. The classic presentation of anaphylaxis begins with pruritus, cutaneous flushing, and urticaria. These symptoms are followed by a sense of fullness in the throat, anxiety, a sensation of chest tightness, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. A complaint of a lump in the throat and hoarseness heralds life-threatening laryngeal edema in a patient with symptoms of anaphylaxis. These major symptoms may be accompanied by abdominal pain or cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, bronchospasm, rhinorrhea, conjunctivitis, and or hypotension. As the cascade progresses, respiratory distress, a decreased level of consciousness, and circulatory collapse may ensue. In several cases, loss of consciousness and cardiorespiratory arrest may result. 
Signs and symptoms begin suddenly, often within 60 minutes of exposure in most patients. In general, the faster the onset of symptoms, the more severe is the reaction. One half of anaphylactic fatalities occur within the first hour. After the initial signs and symptoms abate, patients are at a small risk of recurrence of symptoms caused by a second phase of mediator release, peaking 8 to 11 hours after the initial exposure and manifesting symptoms and signs 3 to 4 hours after the initial clinical manifestations have cleared. The late phase allergic reaction is primarily mediated by the release of newly generated cystelyl leukotrienes, the former slow reacting substance of anaphylaxis. The incidence of this biphasic phenomenon has been reported to vary widely up to 20%, but prospective studies specifically searching for clinically important biphasic events report an incidence of 4 to 5%. The diagnosis of anaphylaxis is clinical, and we consider it when involvement of any two or more body systems is observed with or without hypotension or airway compromise. The diagnosis is easily made when there's a clear history of exposure, such as a bee sting, shortly followed by multi-system signs and symptoms described above. However, diagnosis is not always easy or clear because symptoms may mimic other presentations or the onset may be delayed. The differential diagnosis of anaphylactic reactions includes vasovagal reactions, myocardial ischemia, arrhythmias, severe acute asthma, seizure, epiglottitis, hereditary angioedema, foreign body airway obstruction, carcinoid, mastocytosis, vocal cord dysfunction, and non-IgE-mediated drug reactions. The most common of these is the vasovagal reaction, which is characterized by hypotension, pallor, bradycardia, diaphoresis, and weakness, and sometimes by loss of consciousness. Laboratory investigations are of minimal utility. So the clinical manifestations of anaphylaxis include respiratory, cardiovascular, skin, gastrointestinal, and neurologic manifestations. For respiratory manifestations, these include pharyngeal or laryngeal edema, shortness of breath and or wheezing, and rhinitis. For cardiovascular, we have hypotension and chest pain. For the skin, we have urticaria and or angioedema, flushing, and pruritus. For gastrointestinal, we have nausea, emesis, cramps, or diarrhea. And for neurologic, we have headaches and seizures. When treating anaphylaxis patients, we triage all acute allergic reactions at the highest level of urgency because of the possibility of sudden deterioration. First-line therapy involves emergency management, so we assess airway, breathing, and circulation. We assess vital signs and pulse oximetry. In severe anaphylaxis, securing the airway is the first priority. We examine the mouth, pharynx, and neck for signs and symptoms of angioedema, such as uvula edema or high drops, audible stridor, respiratory distress, or hypoxia. If angioedema is producing respiratory distress, we intubate early because delay may result in complete airway obstruction secondary to progression of angioedema. We provide sufficient oxygen to maintain arterial oxygen saturation at greater than 90%. If the causative agent can be identified, termination of exposure should be attempted. We do not recommend gastric lavage for foodborne allergens because it may be associated with complications like aspiration and delays in the administration of more effective treatments like epinephrine. For insect stings, we remove any remaining stinging remnants because the stinger continues to inject venom even if it is detached from the insect. So when it comes to first-line therapy, drug-wise, we have epinephrine, which is given intramuscularly at 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams of a 1 is to 1,000 dilution or an EpiPen. The pediatric dose is 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram with the same dilution. Intravenous bolus of epinephrine is 100 micrograms over 5 to 10 minutes. We mix 0 0.1 milligram of a 1 is to 1,000 dilution in 10 ml of normal saline and infuse over 5 to 10 minutes. And the IV infusion method of administering epinephrine starts at 1 microgram per minute and we mix 1 milligram of the 1 is to 1000 dilution in 500 milliliters of normal saline and infuse at 0 0.5 ml per minute and titrate the dose as needed. In the pediatric population, this dose is 0.1 to 0.3 microgram per kilogram per minute. Second line therapy includes diphenhydramine at 25 to 50 milligrams every six hours, IV, IM, or per RM. 
but in pediatric patients, it's 1 mg per kilogram every 6 hours as well. H2 blockers include ranitidin at 50 mg IV over 5 minutes, and in pediatric patients, it's 0 0.5 mg per kilogram IV over 5 minutes. Cimetidine is not really recommended anymore, but it's 300 mg IV in adults and 4 to 8 mg per kilogram IV in pediatric patients. Corticosteroids include hydrocortisone at 250 to 500 mg IV or in children, 5 to 10 mg per kilogram IV with a maximum of 500 mg. Methylprednisolone is 80 to 125 mg IV in adults and 1 to 2 mg per kilogram IV with a maximum of 125 mg in pediatric patients. And prednisone is given 40 to 60 mg per day per RM divided twice a day or daily. And in pediatric patients, it's 1 to 2 mg per day per RM divided twice a day or daily. And to be used after initial IV dose, for outpatients, 3 to 5 days tapering is not required. When we treat bronchospasm, we can give salbutamol or ipratropium bromide or also magnesium sulfate. So basically similar therapy as for asthma. And for treating patients on beta blockers with refractory hypotension, we add glucagon at 1 mg IV every 5 minutes until hypotension resolves, followed by 5 to 15 micrograms per minute infusion with a dose of 50 micrograms per kilogram IV every 5 minutes in pediatric patients. Epinephrine is a mixed alpha-1 and beta receptor agent. The alpha-1 receptor activation reduces mucosal edema and treats hypotension, and beta-1 receptor stimulation increases heart rate and myocardial contractility, while beta-2 receptor stimulation provides bronchodilation and limits further mediator release. It is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. Hypotension is generally the result of distributive shock and response to fluid resuscitation in the setting of anaphylaxis. We administer an isotonic crystalloid solution bolus of 1 to 2 liters in adults and 10 to 20 ml per kilogram in children concurrently with epinephrine. There is no evidence that albumin or hypertonic saline should replace crystalloids. Second line treatments include corticosteroids, antihistamines, inhaled bronchodilators, vasopressors, and glucagon. So patients with anaphylaxis often receive corticosteroids to prevent protracted and biphasic reactions, although evidence for clinical benefit is scant and primarily derived from acute asthma studies. Most patients with anaphylaxis should receive an H1 antihistamine, such as diphenhydramine, 5 25 to 50 mg IV by slow infusion or via IM injection, although clinical benefit is also unproven. In severe cases, especially with circulatory shock, H2 antihistamines such as ranitidine or cimetidine are recommended, but cimetidine should not be used for patients who are elderly due to side effects, for those who have multiple comorbidities due to interference with metabolism of many drugs, those with renal or hepatic impairment, or those whose anaphylaxis is complicated by beta blocker use. This is because cimetidine prolongs metabolism of beta blockers and may prolong anaphylactic state. For allergies and angioedema, urticaria or hives is a cutaneous reaction marked by acute onset of pyritic erythemic wheels of varying size that are generally described as fleeting. Erythema multiforme is a more pronounced variation of urticaria characterized by typical target skin lesions. Although these manifestations may accompany many allergic reactions, they also may be non-allergic. Many acute urticarial reactions are due to viruses, especially in children, or present as hives persisting or recurring for more than 24 hours. Treatment of urticarial reactions is generally supportive and symptomatic with attempts to identify and remove the offending agent. H1 antihistamines with or without corticosteroids are usually sufficient, although epinephrine can be considered in severe or refractory cases. The addition of an H2 antihistamine such as ranitidine may also be useful in more severe chronic or unresponsive cases. Cold compresses may be soothing to affected areas. Angioedema is a similar reaction as urticaria but with deeper involvement, characterized by edema formation in the dermis, generally involving the face and neck and distal extremities. Angioedema of the tongue, lips, and face has the potential for airway obstruction. Angioedema is caused by a variety of agents, but ACE eyes are a common trigger with angioedema occurring in 0.1 to 0.7% of patients taking ACE eyes. 
The pathophysiology of ASI-induced angioedema is complex, involving both bradykinin and substance P. If it is induced by ACE inhibitors, the management of angioedema is supportive with special attention to the airway, which can become occluded rapidly and unpredictably. Hereditary angioedema also occurs. It's a rare autosomal dominant disorder due to a deficiency in C1 esterase inhibitor with either low levels or type 1 or a dysfunctional enzyme or type 2. So when it comes to pharmacologic treatment of angioedema in adults, we have C1 esterase inhibitor human, C1 esterase inhibitor recombinant, ecantibant, and ecalantide, which are probably not available in our setting. When it comes to allergic drug reactions, these are a common clinical problem, but true hypersensitivity reactions probably account for less than 10% of these occurrences, with the majority of anaphylaxis from IgE-mediating drug reactions. Most drugs are small organic molecules, generally unable to stimulate an immune response alone. However, when a drug or metabolite becomes protein-bound, either in serum or on cell surfaces, the drug protein complex can become an allergen and stimulate immune system responses. Penicillin is the drug most commonly implicated in eliciting true allergic reactions and accounts for approximately 90% of all reported allergic drug reactions and about 75% of fatal anaphylactic drug reactions. Fatal reactions can occur without a prior allergic history, and less than 25% of patients who die of penicillin-induced anaphylaxis exhibited allergic reactions during previous treatment with the drug. The clinical manifestations of drug allergy vary widely. A generalized reaction similar to immune complex or serum sickness reactions is very common, especially with trimetoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and certain cephalosporins. Sulfa moieties are contained in many drugs, but sulfa allergic reactions upon exposure to non-antibiotic sulfas are uncommon. Serum sickness usually begins in the first or second week after initiation of the drug and can take many weeks to subside after drug withdrawal. Generalized malaise, arthralgias, arthritis, pruritus, orticarial eruptions, fever, adenopathy, and hepatosplenomegaly are common signs and symptoms. Drug fever may occur without other associated clinical findings and may also occur without an immunologic basis. Circulating immune complexes are probably responsible for the lupus-like reactions caused by some drugs. Cytotoxic reactions also may occur, such as with penicillin-induced hemolytic anemia. Skin eruptions include erythema, pruritus, urticaria, angioedema, erythema multiforme, and photosensitivity. Severe reactions such as those in Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis may also occur. Delayed hypersensitivity reactions can manifest as contact dermatitis from drugs that are applied topically. Our reference is Tintinalis Emergency Medicine. Thank you.